temporarily. The, the subcommittee will come to order uh, without objection. The chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Uh, we welcome everyone to today's hearing on the role of pharmacy benefit managers. Uh, the chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Massey, is on the floor, and given in the interest of time and everyone else's presence here, uh, I'm going to proceed until he's able to join us. And uh, in light of that, I'll now recognize myself for an opening statement. Today's hearing will examine the role of pharmacy benefit managers, known as PBMs, in the healthcare industry, including the ability of PBMs to control access to and the pricing of pharmaceutical products. PBMs serve as one of a handful of intermediaries between the pharmaceutical manufacturers that make prescription drugs and the patients who consume them. While PBMs are just one link in the pharmaceutical distribution chain, we have all heard of their out alleged outsized influence in the market. According to some estimates, the, three, the largest three PBMs account for nearly 80% of the market for pharmacy benefit services. The top three PBMs are members of vertically integrated companies that also own insurance companies, provider groups, and pharmacies. In some cases, a patient can purchase insurance, see a doctor, and buy prescription drugs from three companies that are all owned by the same parent company. Many claim that this level of vertical integration is highly beneficial for patients. By reducing administrative fees and leveraging their sheer size, large, vertically integrated conglomerates are often able to operate more efficiently than disaggregated companies. Additionally, having a vast network of options for patients ensures that patients are likely to face the same treatment options regardless where they are in the country. However, vertical integration is not without potential harms to patients. Because vertically integrated PBMs control so much of the supply chain, and because there are so few competitors in the market, PBMs have almost complete control over a patient's access to medications. PBMs have the ability to control which pharmacies are available to fill prescriptions, sometimes steering patients to PBM-owned pharmacies. PBMs also have the ability to control which medications are available under a patient's health care coverage. Even if a medication is covered, patients often do not know how much a prescription drug will cost until they, register, until they get to, register, to the register. For most other products, a consumer can research the price of a good, of a good well in advance of the point of purchase. However, a lack of price transparency has unfortunately become the norm in the healthcare industry. We are holding a bipartisan hearing today because across the board we are hearing the same things from our constituents. When we go home to our districts, we hear about the high cost of prescription drugs. We hear about the confusion people face in regard to the price of healthcare. And we hear about the lack of access to community-based independent pharmacies. While pharmacies run by vertically integrated conglomerates can save patients money, some patients want the option of using their local pharmacist. However, for independent pharmacists, the take-it-or-leave-it contracts they sign with large PBMs trap them into inflexible arrangements that leave little room for innovation. Also, for many independent pharmacists, Operating outside of a large PBM's network effectively means closing shop. Without a PBM's patience, there isn't enough business to go around. Today, we have the opportunity to hear from experts in this field who have been studying the healthcare supply chain for decades. These experts are at the forefront of academic scholarship on health policy and are prepared to help us better understand the operations of the market and the costs and benefits of PBMs more broadly. This information will better inform us as we work on possible <clears> solutions <throat> and consider the proposals that have already been introduced. I want to thank the witnesses for appearing before us today, and I look forward to hearing what each of you has to say. I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Correa, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. Appreciate you being here today. Um, today, we're going to examine the role of pharmacy benefit managers or PBMs and their impact on our healthcare system 
in the pharmaceutical drug delivery market. And nothing is so simple about this topic, but one thing is certain, things just ain't right. And as the late great Justice Louis Brandeis would say, sunshine is the best disinfectant. So I hope that today the sun will shine brightly as we work to lift the veil on the PBMs and their role on drug pricing and the drug delivery market. Until recently, most people didn't even know that PBMs existed, and now we see their handiwork everywhere. While some of us Americans with good health plans and low deductibles may secure our medications at reasonable rates, there are too many hardworking Americans who can't afford medications. There are too many heart-wrenching stories of families having to choose between medications that they need to survive and food or housing. And that is not right. Decisions, life and death decisions, are being made today for Americans in closed backroom deals. Instead, they should be made by their medical providers. And that is also not right. We need to find solutions to these problems like we did when Congress and the Biden-Harris administration passed the Inflation Reduction Act, capping the monthly price of insulin and other critical drugs for Medicare beneficiaries. We have a responsibility to all Americans to ensure that they can fairly access the medications they need. And I hope today we will learn more from the witnesses on to how to achieve this goal. Let me call your attention to this chart. Nothing is simple about this chart. And see here, point of payments from manufacturers to PBMs. It says payments from manufacturers to PBMs. Well, there isn't just one payment made that applies to everyone. There are many payments depending on the drug, the PBM, the manufacturer, and the deal that is reached. What each consumer pays for his medication is even more complicated, and this payment is only the first step. Understanding how the system works, partially because of the complexity and partially due to the lack of transparency, requires an advanced degree in engineering design. Which drugs are included on the PBM created formularies or the list of drugs in a healthcare plan and how much people pay following a convoluted process involving a number of entities, the PBMs, the wholesalers, the aggregators or group purchasing organizations, it's pharmacy service administrative organizations, health plans, pharmaceutical companies, pharmacists, and even the employers. Everyday Americans are at their mercy relying on all these entities to do the right thing. The complexities appear integral to the design. It's an enigma, wrapped in a mystery, hidden in a riddle, in a conundrum. The average American and many small businesses can't solve this alone. And of course, on Main Street, I'm concerned with the stories I'm hearing about pharmacies closing, pharmacies receiving payments that don't cover the costs, or pharmacies having to face payments being clawed back by PBMs. If these stories are true, this is both unsustainable and unacceptable. But let's be clear, PBMs have and will continue to play an important role in this market. And any suggestions to do away with them are misplaced. But over the years, the role of PBMs in the marketplace has expanded from simply processing claims to having involvement in almost all aspects of the pharmaceutical drug market. And in fact, there are numerous studies showing that PBMs have lowered prices of drugs for their clients. But it should never be the case that a person with insurance should pay more at the pharmacy using insurance than off insurance. But that 
appears to be happening in some cases. And that also is not right. As the New York Times reported in its recent investigation, the job of the PBMs is to reduce drug costs. Instead, they frequently do the opposite. They steer patients towards pricier drugs, charge steep markups on what would otherwise be inexpensive medications, and extract billions of dollars in hidden fees. Another mechanism the PBMs may be utilizing is to raise costs and reap profits through mail order pharmacies. As the Wall Street Journal reported, PBMs encouraged employers to use mail order pharmacies with a promise of cost savings, but instead, they are increasing costs. Specifically, the Wall Street Journal article explained branded drugs filled by mail order were marked up an average of three to six times higher than the cost of medicines dispensed by chain and grocery store pharmacies, and roughly 35 times higher than those filled by independent pharmacies. This subcommittee has jurisdiction over antitrust matters, and we need to understand how this market operates. According to the FTC's recent released interim report on PBMs, the top three PBMs control almost 80% of the prescription drug market, something that came into play over the years of mergers with competitors. I can show you the chart. The left, or it was before, to the right is what exists today. This chart shows the extent of how the number of large competitors consolidated over the last two decades, and it appears now that the PBM market is overly concentrated, but is that causing an anti-competitive result? And the FTC seems to say yes. The extent of vertical integration in the market is also astonishing, and quite frankly, as you see on this chart, every major health plant is connected to a PBM. Specialty and mail-in pharmacies, and even one owns retail pharmacies. And some are not producing their own drugs for the market. While vertical integration can yield important efficiencies and benefits for customers, it appears that these deep connections are harming independent pharmacists, driving up costs, and harming consumers while enriching corporations. The FTC's interim report included many worrisome illusions and conclusions that PBMs are harming competition and consumers. Some of their conclusions, the PBM market is highly concentrated. PBMs, due to their consolidation integration, exercise a significant power over Americans access to drugs and the price they pay. And PBMs may be steering patients to their own pharmacies and extracting additional profit while harming unaffiliated pharmacies. PBMs are using their market power to force pharmacies to enter into unfair contracts. And finally, PBMs are limiting access to more reasonably priced alternative drugs through contract terms benefiting themselves. Finally, I'd say to the FTC, it's time to fish or cut bait. If PBMs are engaging in anti-competitive activities outlined in your report, do something. Either bring an action or explain why you're not bringing action. And Mr. Chair, finally, I ask that the following documents be included for the record. First, the FTC Interim Report Pharmacy Benefit Managers. Second, the 2024 Economic Report on U.S. Pharmacies and Pharmacy Benefit Managers. Three, a brief, out, a brief look at current databases about pharmacy benefit managers. Four, the op opaque industry secretly inflating prices for prescription drugs. 
Number five, mail order drugs, we're supposed to keep costs down. It's doing the opposite. Number six, pharma response to the joint DOJ, FTC, HHS, AirFi consolidation of healthcare markets. Seven, PBMs and prescription drug distribution. And finally, California Life Science and California Pharmacists Association joint letter on PBM reforms. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with that, I yield. With, without objection. Thank you. Um, I now recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, I appreciate you putting this hearing together. The ranking member just talked about the FTC needs to do something. Um, maybe if they weren't so busy harassing Elon Musk, they'd have a chance to actually look at this issue in a, in a real way. Uh, you know, you got three companies have 80% of the market, and the FTC wants to send letters to Elon Musk asking who, what journalist he's talking to. That might be a problem instead of dealing with the issue in front of us. So I appreciate the chairman calling in these experts, working with the other party to agree to the four witnesses, and having this important hearing on something that impacts every single one of our constituents uh, in a real way. And with that, I would yield back. I thank the chairman. I now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Nadler, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the price of prescription drugs is out of control, and it is directly affecting the health and safety of our constituents. Over 9 million adults have skipped medications prescribed to them because they could not afford them, with women, people with disabilities, and the uninsured most affected. Prices are skyrocketing, and people are dying or not getting the care they need, while healthcare giants reap massive profits, merge with other companies to entrench their dominance, and obscure critical information from Congress and regulators about their practices. One reason that prescription drugs have become unaffordable for so many people is the growing dominance in the healthcare market of pharmacy benefit managers, or PBMs, who serve as middlemen between drug manufacturers, health insurers, healthcare providers, and pharmacies. As a recent FTC report found, the PBM market is highly concentrated, with the largest PBMs vertically integrated with the nation's largest health insurers and specialty and retail pharmacies. As a result, the leading PBMs exercise significant market power over consumers' access to drugs and the prices paid for those medicines. This includes steering contracts to their own affiliated businesses and away from local independently owned pharmacies. They also have the ability to negotiate higher drug prices while limiting access to potentially lower cost generic alternatives. And because of their dominance, they're able to keep their practices largely shrouded in secrecy. <coughs> To address these concerns, we must act to increase competition in the PBM market. But to be clear, the problem is bigger than the pharmacy benefit managers. It is true that only three PBMs control 80% of the market, but PBMs play just one part in our overly concentrated healthcare system. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle not to lose sight of the forest for the trees. If we truly want to address the rising cost of prescription drugs in healthcare, we must address consolidation industry-wide, rather than just focusing on one class of middlemen. For example, 90% of all drugs are distributed through just three drug wholesalers. 95% of all health insurance markets are highly concentrated, and approximately 50% of all generic drug markets are dominated either by monopoly or duopoly drug manufacturers when controlling for volume. Not only does this lack of competition lead to higher prices, but it also allows the dominant companies to avoid transparency. An environment in which a handful of companies control Americans' access to and prices for critical medications means that we all lose. We lose out on a more innovative healthcare market. We lose money paying exorbitant prices for drugs. We lose time fighting with our insurance provider for access to the drug our doctor prescribed. We lose knowledgeable counseling from our local independent pharmacist. And in the worst cases, we lose a loved one who could not access or afford the medicines they need. Although interest in PBMs has ramped up this Congress, 
Their market dominance and their role in driving up drug prices is not news. This subcommittee addressed the issue five years ago under a Democratic majority. But we did not just talk about it, we took action. It is time for this Republican majority to act as well. We do not need another rehash of known issues with no goals or plans in mind to fix them. Democrats have taken action to rein in high drug costs and to make medication more affordable and accessible. Last Congress, over unanimous Republican opposition, Democrats passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which expanded Medicare benefits, lowered drug costs, and strengthened Medicare for the future. This committee also passed three bipartisan bills that would have addressed drug pricing. The Stop Stalling Access to Affordable Medications Act, the Affordable Prescriptions for Patients Through Promoting Competition Act, and the Preserve Access to Affordable Generics and Biosimilars Act. Republicans have failed to advance any of these bills during this Congress. It is my hope that as we continue our work to diagnose the problems associated with consolidation and anti-competitive conduct in healthcare markets, we will also work together on finding meaningful solutions that would provide a better deal for Americans on prescription drugs and other health care costs. I thank our witnesses for appearing today, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Um, without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. I want to say before I introduce today's witnesses that uh, I want to thank my ranking member, Mr. Correa, for making this a bipartisan hearing. This is one of those hearings that uh, doesn't quite frequently happen in Congress. We don't know what the answer is. That is why we are having the hearing. A lot of times, I'm not a lawyer, that the lawyers say don't ask a question unless you know the answer. I'm gonna ask questions I don't know the answer to today. Um, and, I, and I'm also very appreciative of the witnesses who came here and the ranking member for making this a bipartisan panel. Oftentimes, you'll get some Republican witnesses and some Democrat witnesses. I don't know your political affiliations, don't need to know them, uh, and that's because we're working for the people here today. And uh, thank you, Mr. Correa, for... Mr. Chair, thank you very much. I think you've just outlined the heavy burden that these witnesses have <laughs> in educating the committee on where to go from here. Thank you. And and that's a, that's a heavy lift to educate congressmen. So um, with that, I'll now introduce today's witnesses. Dr. Richard, oh, I'm sorry, we're gonna start from right to left, I believe. Dr. Anthony Losasso. Dr. Losasso is a professor, Dry House Fellow, and the chair of the Department of Economics at the Dry House College of Business at DePaul University. His research focuses on health and labor economics, health policy and health services and outcomes. Dr. Joey Mattingly II, and Dr. Mattingly is an Associate Professor and Vice Chair of Research at the University of Utah College of Pharmacy. He has worked in pharmacy for over 20 years, both as a pharmacist and more recently as an academic fo focusing on drug pricing policy. Dr. Richard Frank. Dr. Frank is the Director of the Center on Health Policy and a Senior Fellow in Economic Studies at the Brookings Institution. He is the Emeritus Margaret T. Morse, Professor of Health Economics at Harvard Medical School, and previously served as the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Karen Van Nuys. Dr. Van Nuys is the Executive Director of the, Val of the Value of Life Sciences Innovation Program and a Senior Scholar at the USC Schaefer Institute. Her research focuses on the pharmaceutical distribution system and the impact of intermediaries, business practices on prescription drug utilization and cost. We welcome our witnesses and thank them for appearing today. We will begin by swearing you in. Would you please rise and raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Let the record reflect the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Thank you, please be seated. Please know that your written testimony will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, we ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. Dr. F oh, Dr. Lo Sasso, you may begin. Thank you, uh, Chairman Massey and Ranking Member Correa and members of the committee. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today uh, to be part of this conversation on this really important topic. 
Uh, my name is Tony Lasasso. I am the chair of the economics department at DePaul University in Chicago and have been studying the healthcare system for about the last 30 years. PBMs uh, are an important but widely misunderstood and I believe wrongfully maligned part of the pharmaceutical supply chain. Um, I like to point out to people that uh, uh, no less than ancient Greek philosopher Plato had serious misgivings about middlemen. So you're in good company when you uh, express skepticism uh, and concern about the role of middlemen. However, we're going to talk a lot today, I hope, about nuances. Uh, we'll talk about spread pricing and a lot of other uh, pharmacy networks, lots of details. But at heart, what PBMs do is force pharmaceutical companies to compete on price. And competing on price, generally speaking, is the last thing that pharmaceutical companies want to do. I find it somewhat amazing that rebates have been made into some sort of nefarious practice. Uh, this to me is testimony to apparently a reality distortion that the pharmaceutical industry is capable of, of pulling off. Rebates are a good thing because they represent price decreases and price competition is a good thing for consumers. So the effort to regulate and I fear neuter the impact of PBMs only plays into the hands of the pharmaceutical industry and strengthens their bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis PBMs. Now, make no mistake, I am a fan of the pharmaceutical industry. They are an engine of innovation uh, that truly improves lives and I want them to succeed. I want us all to live to be 120 and, 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 and be happy and healthy. Um, but that does not mean that pharma should get a hall pass from competition. Pharma has very rich profit margins, uh, monopoly privilege that comes with patent protection, and they are by and large firmly in the driver's seat when it comes to pricing power. There's a lot of talk about concentration in the PBM industry, rightfully so. However, the flip side of that is with that market concentration, which again is not monopoly, 70, 80 percent, that's, that is big, that is significant, that does not mean that there is not entry in that industry, um, PBM's industry that is, but with that, with that concentration does come bargaining power and an ability to push back and uh, against what I just mentioned as the pricing power of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, complaints from pharmacies, which I'm sure we'll discuss, uh, I think distract from the key issues around getting drugs efficiently to patients. Um, many uh, uh, pharmacies, independent and otherwise, have, have lived off of high dispensing fees for many years. Um, pushback against that uh, is a good thing. It's a good thing for consumers. It may not be a good thing for independent pharmacists, but the market is tough, and I think we want to be in the business of encouraging competition that pushes entities towards being more efficient. Doctors, and, and I mean the real doctors that help people, they know that for people with chronic disease, adherence is an enormous factor when it comes to drug delivery. And mail order has been proven to be a mechanism to improve adherence to a drug regime. So to wrap up, I think it's essential that we recognize the value of PBMs and support their continued role in the healthcare system. Um, so we should focus on enhancing, wherever possible, market mechanisms um, in the pharmaceutical supply chain. Uh, and so I just simply urge this committee to carefully consider the broader implications and potential for unintended consequences of any legislation or regulatory uh, efforts that might weaken the role of PBMs. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Lasasso. Dr. Mattingly, you may begin. Chairman Massey, Ranking Member Correa, and members of the subcommittee, Thank you. Thanks again for this opportunity. My name is Joey Mattingly. I'm a pharmacist and a health economist uh, on the faculty at the University of Utah. 
I study drug pricing policy, uh, pharmacy supply chain dynamics, and just ways to improve our healthcare system. I also support our university uh, human resources team that's responsible for managing the benefits for 30,000 beneficiaries. I've worked in this field for 20 years, uh, starting as a phar pharmacy technician in my hometown of Bargetown, Kentucky, uh, then becoming a pharmacist and a district manager for a large uh, grocery store chain. Uh, the past 10 years has been focused on drug uh, pricing research, academic research specifically, talking about what we're getting into today. While the increase in interest in regulating PBMs allows us to have a really rich discussion on how we pay for pharmaceuticals, my fear is that advocacy efforts by all stakeholders involved st who stand to win or lose from the regulation, it just distracts us from facts. I've had the pleasure of working with all stakeholders involved in these policy fights, and I genuinely empathize with all the stakeholders. In my written testimony, I've tried to detail several key issues in the same way that I would teach my students, which I just wanna give a quick shout out to the University of Utah, my students for helping me prepare for this uh, testimony. Uh, to kick things off, I just wanna highlight three key areas I'd like the committee to consider. We need a process to balance the individual patient goals with the population goals. When I get sick, I can talk to my doctor about a variety of treatment strategies. If that strategy involves a medication, I'm also free to go to any pharmacy I want. However, as an employee of the University of Utah, if I wish to go, uh, if, I, like, if I, as the University of Utah, if I went to wish to use my prescription insurance to pay for that medication, the decision's no longer just a patient doctor decision because I'm essentially asking all my coworkers to pay or contribute for my benefits. So now my healthcare goals have to align with my employers. So we need to work on developing a fair process that finds a win-win for both the patient and the employer, uh, as well as how to settle disagreements. Number two, if you remove the PBM from the equation today, who or what steps in to fill that void? PBMs have been around since the 1960s, and while they have substantially evolved, many of their core functions have remained constant for the past 60 years. PBMs typically gain customers from a process where they uh, respond to competitive bids, uh, re uh, requests for proposals from plan sponsors like employers and governments who are requesting for help developing formularies, managing a pharmacy network. So when we remove the PBM, we just have to know, okay, then what? Who steps in? And who stands to gain from this new environment? Number three, our pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical supply chain is riddled with anti-competitive business practices by design. We have to grapple with the fact that we made a trade-off in the 1960s to essentially, by incentivizing the development of new pharmaceuticals, we decided we would grant innovators a temporary monopoly power or market exclusivities, exclusivities, exclusivity. We, the US citizens, would get this massive investment from the business community, which we have, and then we would have to pay higher prices initially. Uh, 40 years of celebrating the Hatch-Waxman Act. Now we've got a rich generic manufacturing uh, community as well for the last 40 years. Um, but PBMs along this time have evolved to leverage large populations to gain price concessions from these pharmaceutical manufacturers that we grant those uh, exclusivity rights. Additionally, they use their size and their scale to capture price concessions from pharmacies as well. On one hand, this is good if the savings are passed on to the health plans. On the other hand, the price concessions uh, from these, that these pharmacies give make once profitable pharmacies no longer sustainable. So as this subcommittee deliberates whether PBM practices require additional regulation, I just simply ask the members, walk through the same mental exercises I try to ask my students to walk through. Eliminate the PBM from the equation and then play out the scenario for each of these different stakeholders. What happens with patients and their caregivers? What happens with the health plan sponsors? What happens to pharmacies and what happens to drug manufacturers? Thank you all and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Dr. Mattingly. Dr. Frank, you may begin. Oh, make sure your microphone is on and, and uh, pull, pull it okay. near you. There you go. Okay, Chairman Massey, uh, Ranking Member Correa, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me here today to talk about the um, role of P pharmacy benefit managers or PBMs. Uh, in my remarks here, I want to uh, touch on three issues. Uh, first, how PBMs are paid and what that implies for the market. Second, market structure within which PBMs operate, specifically vertical integration of PBMs and insurers on one hand 
and highly concentrated horizontal markets for PBM services on the other. Third, I want to talk about uh, the circumstances facing independent retail pharmacies and the role that PBMs play in that. So let me start by noting that PBMs came to prominence by introducing pro-competitive incentives into the market for prescription drugs, and that resulted in price concessions that are estimated to be 10 to 28 percent. Turning now to payment, PBMs are paid in several ways. The first is service fees for performing specific functions like claims processing. The second uh, form of payment is to, is to retain part of rebates that they negotiate. Estimates of retention uh, rates fall in the 9 to 13 percent range. Rebate retention uh, creates incentives for PBMs to bargain hard. PBMs also earn revenues through a variety of fees charged to pharmacies, and some, P some PBM revenues come about because they pay less to pharmacies than they charge the insurer or the employer. That's called spread pricing. PBMs negotiate a mix of fees, retained rebates, and spreads with their customers. So when larger re retained rebates happen and spread prices are larger uh, in allowable contracts, service fees tends to be lower. Now let me turn to market structure. In 2022, uh, the largest four PBMs accounted for 87% of sales. This is due to both scale economies and horizontal mergers that we saw in that chart. This likely gives large PBMs the upper hand in negotiations with some payers and pharmacies, resulting in the ability to extract excess profits. The market has also moved rapidly towards vertical integration. Each of the four top PBMs is integrated with a major insurer. Vertical integration, in theory, can create synergies by managing the drug and the medical benefits together. Those synergies can result in improved patient care and reduced costs. But vertical integration can also have a less happy result, uh, such as avoidance of regulatory rules. This stems from the ability to disguise profits as costs to avoid regulations that, for example, limit the margins of health insurers. Another concern involves potential anti-competitive conduct. For example, insurers may choose to sell their PBM and health insurance services to employers as a package or a bundle, and that would impede competition from insurers who don't have a PBM. The evidence on these things is thin. Uh, there is little evidence showing that there are synergies uh, but there is emerging evidence suggesting that there is regulatory gaming linked to uh, vertical integration. Let me now turn to retail pharmacies. Steering of customers to PBMs to preferred pharmacies is claimed to disadvantage independent pharmacies. This is particularly troubling in rural America because of the greater potential for pharmacy deserts. Independent pharmacies face challenges, though, uh, broad economic challenges such as competition from mail order, smaller scale, and lack of robust purchasing arrangements. The situation for pharmacies, independent pharmacies, is varied. The number of rural independent pharmacies declined 16 percent between 2003 and 2021, while urban chains, I mean, while rural chains grew about 4.5 percent. During that same period, metropolitan uh, independent pharmacies grew 28 percent while the chain pharmacies only grew 10.5%. So it's a mixed picture. Gross margins were flat at around 21% over the recent history. And then there's scale problems. Uh, independent pharmacies uh, dis uh, dispense about a third of the numbers of uh, prescriptions that a chain pharmacy does on average. So they just have a much smaller scale. And their purchasing arrangements uh, leave them sort of 2 to 6 percent uh, with higher costs of about 2 to 6 percent. So uh, in finalizing, uh, let me just make uh, one final comment that I've concluded after undertaking, um, undertaking a view of the landscape that efforts to improve competition and efficiency in PBM markets is a sensible way to go. But being successful in doing that will only make a small difference to the overall drug pricing problem. Thank you for your attention. 
Thank you, Dr. Frank. Dr. Van Nuys, you're now recognized. Honorable members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify about pharmacy benefit managers in our healthcare system. I'm an economist and have been researching pharmaceutical distribution economics at the USC Schaefer Center for the last decade. The opinions I offer here today are my own. PBMs play a crucial role in our healthcare system. They are key intermediaries, managing drug benefits, negotiating rebates, designing formularies, and processing claims. Their central role in the system affords them unique access to data about nearly every transaction in the value chain. The industry's current structure and practices raise significant concerns about market power, pricing distortions, and misaligned incentives that may raise costs for patients, employers, and taxpayers while stifling competition. Today, 3PBMs handle about 80% of the U.S. retail prescription market. All three are vertically integrated with large insurers, specialty pharmacies, and other healthcare entities. Those three vertically integrated companies rank fourth, sixth, and 16th in the Fortune 500, accounting for nearly a trillion dollars in revenue. This concentration of market power, combined with extensive vertical integration, has enabled several concerning practices. I'll give some examples. First, although PBMs are supposed to lower drug costs, we found that involving a PBM increases generic drug costs. We discovered that Medicare could have saved $2.6 billion in 2018 on the most common generic drugs if they had been purchased at Costco for cash. On average, Medicare overpaid by 21%. Second, the current rebate system is driving up branded list prices. We found that between 2014 and 2018, insulin list prices rose 40% while the net prices taken home by manufacturers fell 31%. Those 31% savings that PBMs were negotiating for manufacturers were not passed on. They were absorbed by the PBMs and other intermediaries. Over five years, the share of insulin spending captured by PBMs and other intermediaries more than doubled. Third, we've seen PBMs steer patients to higher cost drugs. They have given more favorable formulary placement to expensive brand name drugs over lower cost generics or biosimilars, likely due to the larger rebates offered on higher priced products. Fourth, spread pricing, where PBMs charge health plans more than they pay pharmacies and pocket the difference, enables PBM to hide their true compensation. A 2018 Ohio State audit found PBMs charged 31% average spreads for generic drugs in its Medicaid managed care system. Finally, PBMs are increasingly restricting access to medications. Schaefer researchers found that from 2011 to 2020, the share of drugs restricted in Medicare Part D plan formularies rose from 32 to 44%. The impact of these inefficiencies in the PBM market is far reaching. Federal programs like Medicare and Medicaid are overpaying for drugs, increasing costs for taxpayers. Employers are struggling to assess whether they're getting value for money from their PBMs. Consumers are facing higher out-of-pocket costs and restricted access to medications, and uninsured individuals are paying inflated cash prices that may put needed medications out of reach. I recommend several policy options to address these market inefficiencies. First, we need more transparency. This means requiring greater disclosure of rebates and true net pricing to PBM clients. CMS should be authorized to develop and publish high quality average net price benchmarks by drug for key supply chain transactions. Second, we need to reevaluate the current rebate system and develop alternatives that better align with patient and payer interests we should ensure that patient out-of-pocket expenditures are based on post-rebate prices. Third, we need to scrutinize vertical integration in the PBM industry more closely. This includes investigating practices that weaken standalone competitors. Finally, we must explore ways to align PBM incentives with the interests of patients and payers. This could involve changing how PBMs are compensated or imposing fiduciary requirements on them. In conclusion, while PBMs play a crucial role in our healthcare system, the current industry structure raises significant concerns about their impact on drug prices, patient access, and overall health costs. By implementing these policy recommendations, we can better harness the potential benefits of PBMs 
for the benefit of patients, employers, workers, and taxpayers. Thank you. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Dr. Van Nuys. I now recognize the, oh, sorry, we will now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions, and I now recognize the gentlewoman from Indiana for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate having this hearing, and I hope we'll have a good discussion. I know we had a lot of about discussion about competition and consolidation, and since we talk about Plato, I have to mention Aristotle about his oligarch, oligarchs and oligopoly issues that he discussed when we have a business control in the government, and that's what is happening in healthcare. Unfortunately, we don't have the markets. We have oligopolies on each sector of healthcare fighting on committees and bankrupting the country and bankrupting the families. So we need to have a serious discussion. It's going to be destruction of our country. Healthcare became the biggest driver of our national debt and debt of American families, one of seven families in, on, on insolvency for medical debt, and we right now have hyperinflation of price, and the system is going to blow up, and a lot of my colleagues on the other side will offer complete government takeover, which is going to be a terrible solution, So, but we need to have a solution. So, And as you know, you know, I'm glad that a chairman of uh, the minority uh, leader of the committee mentioned about Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, but as you know, that actually drove consolidation in hospitals, and as you know, a lot of maybe not with abandoned tent, but a lot of payments were con to consolidate the market, doing through Medicare. We've seen what's happening. You know, a lot of you know what site neutrality does, where hospital overbilling Medicare, roughly 300 billion effect to our budget, and then buying and enslaved doctors. Let's talk about recently Inflation Reduction Act. We give a huge subsidy to big insurance and subsidize their profits through premiums. That's another 300 billion hit to the budget. So we now we have a huge problem there. And we need to have discussion, not look for the evils. You know, there was a reason that PBMs were created, and they're not doing their job too. They're not passing along the rebates to consumer. We do not have competition in that market. Everyone is making a lot of money, and countries going bankrupt. And this is a big problem, whether it's through government subsidy, but this is a government creating monopolies. We subsidize and through Medicare, through Medicaid, through all of the bills, create bar barriers of entry, Affordable Care Act. You know, physicians cannot own hospitals. Well, <laughs> you know, physicians can be owned by hospitals, but cannot own hospitals, and a lot of mandates in insurance and all other industries. So we need to have a serious discussion. And I appreciate you being uh, open-minded, because we all have in it together. We need to get all of the stakeholders to the table, not look who is evil, because it's like a balloon is going to pop up on the other side, because we have enormous opportunity for innovation. And we have to happen. This is will change Americans' lives. It helps us to be a healthier country. And we have to have competition for value and outcomes, not wait until a person gets so sick and keep them alive. As long as they are not dead, they're very profitable in our FIFA service system. And this became so corrupt we have to have a bipartisan conversation, and I hope we can. And I hope people in your industries will be able to step up, because it's very difficult to do it here. As I always say, there is no lobby for the people here, okay? But we are supposed to be the lobby. So I appreciate a lot of my Republican colleagues bringing some transparency and conversation. So I hope my Democrat colleagues will join in some of these discussions, because we have to save health care. So my question, I want maybe go kind of, you know, from looking from a PBM perspective on some other ones. If you would look from some of the key issues, you know, including in, uh, and uh, because I understand, you know, we're going to eliminate PBMs, Big Pharma is going to do whatever they want, and that was they were created, right? But what would you do to make sure that we don't create where we do is a lot of regulating PBMs more, giving insurance commissioners more power, create that they just go lobby more state houses and write bigger checks in the state house, and they will be oligopolies protected at the state level, okay? So we, this is not a solution. So what can we do in that particular industry to make sure that we have a competition for value and have people have access to proper medication, that we have more choices for consumer and be able to have innovative solution entering that and how the PBM market can be more competitive. So I, I think Dr. Losasa, I start with you. And I think I've almost run out of time. So if you briefly can say quickly, Samson, because you have a need to be very quick. Um, thank you, uh, Congresswoman. Um, 
Well, th there's a lot there. Um, I think that um, you, you, you uh, definitely raised some important points there. I, th I think we do want to have a system that um, allows for competition in the drug space that, that represents a meaningful counterweight to, as mentioned earlier, the monopoly privilege that pharmaceutical companies have with patent protection. Uh, and so, so I, I, I guess I would say just be very cautious in closing, ver be very cautious about how you go about trying to regulate it because we've seen many instances where well-intentioned regulation leads to terrible unintended consequences. Generally, it yields back, and I'll recognize the ranking member, Mr. Correa, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and our witnesses I can see clearly now. This has clarified the whole picture. Like my colleague from Indiana said, though, PBMs don't work. The Inflation Reduction Act didn't work. Obamacare didn't work. So, you know, I always try to legislate from the, the view that we don't want to do any harm, do no harm. And we want to be careful with good intentions. There's a lot of, lot of legislative proposals out there right now. Too many of us to look at in this brief time period, but I'm going to talk about three of them right now, and if I can get some very quick opinions from the four of you as to uh, some of these proposals. Banning rebates, Mr. Ms. Van Nuys, Dr. Van Nuys, good or bad? Um, I. It, it's, I can't give you. Complicated. Yeah, it's complicated. Dr. I'm sorry. Frank. This whole industry. But. Banning rebates. Um, I think rebates serve. Mike. Can't please. hear you. I think rebates serve a uh, useful purpose. Uh, I think they have strong incentives. Uh, coupled with market power, they can create problems. Banning rebates, yes, no. No. Dr. Mattingly, banning rebates. No, I, I do think that rebates allow an opportunity to, um, you want the person negotiating the lower price to have some skin in the game too, so uh, it's something we have to debate. Is it 100% pass-through that we want back to the health plan, or do we want the PBM to have uh, opportunity? So there's an incentive, skin in the game, don't ban them is what you're saying. Dr. Luwasso? Um, short answer, no. Um, longer answer, it, rebates themselves are a workaround, a bodge, if you will, that uh, cropped up because probably, arguably, Robinson-Patman Act. So maybe eliminate Robinson-Patman. Okay, <laughs> easier said than done. Uh, second, spread pricing, Dr. Van Nuys. Eliminated, yes or no? Don't eliminate, but I think introduce transparency. Dr. Frank. Transparency is a good idea here. Dr. Matt, was that a no, yes or no on spread pricing eliminated? No. Yes, no. No. Okay, Dr. Manningly, spread pricing. No, same thing. I think there needs to be incentives uh, along the supply chain. Would you also say transparency? Absolutely. Okay, Dr. Lovasso, uh, spread it's, pricing. It's eliminate, no. yes, no. It's a no on eliminating spread pricing because it does align incentives and it, uh, 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 and, and, and as it stands right now, payers have the choice. They could opt for spread pricing or do fees. They generally choose for spread pricing. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm on a roll here. I think we've got some consensus. Let's try the third one here. Transparency, Dr. Van Nuys. More transparency. 100% yes. Dr. Frank. Uh, I'm uh, a, a targeted yes. Uh, I think that there are private negotiations that happen uh, where you get better prices because they're done privately, but there are a variety of places where transparency would be helpful. So the private negotiations are good because? So, for example, rebates are one of the places. Uh, the CBO and the uh, Office of the Actuary at HHS both have scored uh, positive costs uh, if you uh, make the rebates fully transparent. Dr. Mattingly. I think we need to be very clear. Transparency to whom? Transparency is good, but to whom? To so us, if it's, the so world, if, public. Yeah, so if it's, the, if it's to the patient, 
So often the customer of the PBM, or the, the PBM is, is serving a health plan, like an HR director, so maybe we have to talk about what's the transparency from HR to its employees on a, like a self-funded insurance plan or whatnot. So I think we just need to be clear what's the transparency, like who, what we're talking about um, as we're writing these regulations. Dr. Lulasso, transparency, yes, no? Transparency is not a automatic no-brainer, yes. I think there, I, I can go very far afield here and cite a famous study in economics of the Danish ready-mix cement market where prices for cement was mandated by the government to be transparent and prices subsequently rose. Because, Thank you. Yeah. And Dr. Fenton, my 17 seconds left. The FTC interim report provided many examples of harm to healthcare market by PBMs. Can you quickly tell me what the FTC got right and what they got wrong in that report? Dr. Frank. Um, they raised a lot of potential difficulties. Um, however, the uh, evidence presented is pretty thin. Out of time, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Ranking member yields back. Without objection, Ms. Ross will be permitted to participate in today's hearing for the purposes of questioning the witnesses if a member yields her the time for that purpose. And now I'd like to recognize the, the gentleman from Wisconsin for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in the 24 years I was in the Wisconsin State Senate, uh, this issue was something that we worked on. And um, actually, was present, present and, and involved in, in actually trying to move PBM legislation on a couple of occasions. Uh, you know, unfortunately, what we saw was in Wisconsin uh, that there were many, I'll call them hometown pharmacies, smaller independent pharmacies, which many of my constituents who were customers of these pharmacies for many years uh, loved their pharmacist, right? Very, uh, very comfortable with the advice they were being given, uh, and long-term, you know, plans that that was integrated with with their physicians, uh, and uh, but but clearly, what was happening was that the PBMs started to skim, and and as that happened, and they became larger and greater, um, we started to see pharmacies start to close in Wisconsin. Uh, and they ended up at one of the big three, right? Uh, so, uh, Dr. Dr. Lasasso, can you talk a little bit about the landscape and where we were maybe 20 years ago compared to where we are now on the vertical kind of integration of, of PBMs and how they interact with the pharmacies that our constituents deal with all the time? Of course, thank you, Congressman. Um, so yes, as it has been pointed out uh, by uh, folks on this panel and, and, and members of the committee, there has been uh, a quite a great deal, uh, quite a lot of vertical uh, market integration going on in the uh, PBM space. Um, this is again, as has been pointed out, not necessarily a bad thing. There are potential efficiency gains. I, I guess I'll speak to this this idea um, that you raise around. Um, what I guess I would refer to as <clears throat> contracting, creating selective networks of pharmacies where you could have a pharmacy that is, is on the outside will not be part of the network uh, created by the PBM. Selective contracting is a, is a quite old concept in, uh, in healthcare and, and other industries as well, but what it does is it effectively allows for lower prices uh, that are passed on to consumers ultimately. Uh, if, 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 in other words, if, the, if a, a low efficiency, high cost pharmacist, pharmacy cannot meet the terms that the PBM asks of them, they can't be part of the network. And what do we do about that? Yeah, I don't know that, I don't know that we do anything about that, to be honest. I mean, because I, I think, do we want to have a system that props up the inefficient providers in markets? I would argue no, that's not, a, that should not be a policy goal. Um, so I guess I'll pause there. Very good. Um, in July of uh, 2024, the FTC released its uh, interim staff report on PBMs, which concluded that PBMs wield significant power of patients' ability to, a to access affordable drugs. Uh, unlike the 2005 report on PBMs, the report did not have the support of the entire commission. In fact, uh, Commissioner 
uh, Holyoke dissented, arguing that the report failed to meet the standards of economic rigor expected of commission reports more generally. Uh, you know, Chair Khan argued that the report lacked empirical evidence of a number of factors, including the state of competition in the prescription drug market. Dr. Frank, you commented on the FTC report and the Commissioner Holyoke's dissent in, in your testimony. Do you think her concerns about the report were actually legitimate or not? Um, I commented on, on her, um, uh, her dissent as well as one of her colleagues' um, assent to the report. And there were multiple places that both commissioners uh, pointed out that the evidence was pretty thin and it was hard to draw conclusions about sort of some of the big points raised in the report. And uh, I think that uh, my reading is consistent with that. Very good. Just uh, real quick, the Trump era price transparency rule that, that required hospitals to post prices showing their average negotiated rates since 2021. Uh, and many of the hospitals that, that we worked in with in Wisconsin have implemented tools on their own. You know, they've kind of created a website so that there's transparency. Uh, Dr. Mattingly, do, do you believe that a, a similar price transparency rule for PBMs uh, would be a positive step? I mean, do you think it, it is being utilized and would it work? Um, yeah, I do want to entertain, sorry, I do want to entertain something like that. I think it could be positive. I think it's really important to recognize that for some generic prices, it's maybe helpful. It's not, you know, we can look and see what a price of a low cost generic is, but if it's a really high cost brand medication, knowing what the price is isn't going to matter if you need that drug, you know, like, like so if it's a life saving, saving medication, it's not going to matter what the price is. You can tell it, you can post it everywhere you want. And I still need it, you know? So I guess we just gotta figure out like, when is it actually gonna help? Yeah, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Um, now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Nadler, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Van Nuys, in your written testimony, you discussed the practice of uh, spread pricing. Could you explain how this practice works and why it's concerning, especially in the context of government programs like Medicaid? Yes, spread pricing is the practice where a pharmacy benefit manager reimburses the pharmacy one rate for filling a prescription and then charges the health plan a different higher rate for filling that same prescription, and then they keep the difference. Um, and that's called the spread. Um, the, the health plan does not see what the pharmacy is re reimbursed. And as a result, the health plan doesn't know what they are paying. Part of, part of what they are paying for pharmacy benefit services is that spread, and they don't know how big it is. And nobody can make a good, sound economic decision without knowing what prices they're paying. Um, we, uh, the state of Ohio, audited its Medicaid managed care program in 2018 and learned that they were being charged those spreads of 31% on average on generic drugs. As a result, they fired their PBMs, which suggests to me that they were very surprised to learn that the spreads were as high as they were. And they would not have known about those if they had not done this audit. So I think that having spread pricing, the practice by itself is not as problematic as the fact that there's no transparency into it, and it actually masks prices and comp compensation levels for PBMs. Thank you, Dr. Van Nuys. How do PBM practices affect the uninsured? Uh, the uninsured? Oh, um, so when it comes to negotiating the prices of brand drugs, pharmacy benefit managers and and drug manufacturers negotiate over the list price of the drug and the rebate. We've heard, we've heard a little bit about rebates here, right? And so what they, in the process of negotiating that, the PBM wants a higher rebate because they get to keep a part of it, and the manufacturer wants to pay a higher rebate because that will get them preferred placement on the formulary. So both of those agents are sort of working towards higher rebates, but what that tends, tends to do is push up the list price of the drug because the rebate is taken out of the list price and the net price is what remains. And no one's pushing in the other direction. And no one's pushing in the, uh, not on the list price. Um, and so uninsured patients 
frequently face the list price of the drug, not that negotiated net price after the rebate, but the list price of the drug. So the uninsured pay higher prices than the insured? Yeah. Dr. Frank, we have talked about a lack of competition in the PBM market contributing to high drug prices. Do you believe this is also a problem in other sectors of the healthcare industry? The concentration is problematic elsewhere? Absolutely. Um, I, uh, I think we see it a bit in Medicare Advantage, for example, and uh, that, you know, that would be one of the places that um, I think is a poster child for sort of high levels of concentration. And what recommendations do you have for promoting competition in hospital and physician markets? <laughs> um, well, I'll give you one example. Uh, in Medicare Advantage, um, we have set things up so that the county is where competition happens, right? That's, that's the way the markets are defined. That's fine in, uh, in your borough. It's uh, not so great in Nebraska. And I think the, uh, what we could do to promote competition is make markets larger so that uh, companies that enter uh, can count on getting a lot of business. Uh, in New York, it's true. In Nebraska, not so much. New York what? In New York, it's true that you, you go into that mm -hmm. market, there are a lot of bodies there to, for you to compete for. That's less true in Nebraska. And so by making the markets geographically larger, getting more people in, you create incentives for more entry and competition. Thank you, Dr. Van Nuys and Dr. Frank, in order. What reforms do you recommend that Congress take to address the concerns related to PBMs? Dr. Van Nuys, let's start with you. Uh, I recommend creating greater transparency by developing and publishing pricing benchmarks that are true net pricing benchmarks um, so that the folks who are transacting in these markets can actually make better economic decisions, know what prices they're facing. Dr. Frank? I guess I would try to do things that promote uh, competition from independent uh, pharmacies, I mean independent PBMs, uh, because right now you've got the three vertically integrated ones, and there are sort of some mid-size independent PBMs, and trying to get them and others like them to uh, um, be able to compete uh, more effectively in doing things to encourage their entry into the market, uh, I think could go a long way to help. You mentioned the three vertically integrated PBMs. Do you think antitrust action should be taken against them? Um, well, uh, no, not, well, let me tell you what my concern with taking antitrust action is. Um, the areas of antitrust that are the hardest to make a case on, where the uh, case law and the economics is messiest, is in vertical relations. And I think that you'd have to go after that. And because the process is very long, long litigation, highly uncertain given the messiness of the area, I think I would try something else first. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. And I'll recognize the. Uh, the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Jordan, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this important hearing. Dr. Lasasso, you started off our testimony, I think it was your second sentence, you said even Plato didn't like, uh, doesn't like or didn't like uh, middlemen, referring to the PBMs. But the way I understand it, and again, just a country boy here, but PBMs work with insurance companies to negotiate prices with manufacturers and then dictate to the pharmacy what they get paid. And if you're not in the network, look out. They're coming, you're in trouble. That doesn't sound like a middleman. That sounds like the dictator at the top. That sounds like a monopoly. That's the concern, and particularly when 80% of the market is vertically integrated, as the gentleman just pointed out, as the ranking member just pointed out. So um, I guess I would go back to the question the ranking member just asked Dr. Frank. Why, why isn't this an antitrust concern? I guess I'll start with the guy who brought up the middleman at the start of the hearing, Dr. Lasasso. Thank you, Congressman. Um, so yes, I, broadly speaking, the picture you paint is is uh, more well, or less. Well, accurate. first of all, is the picture accurate? I'm not. I'm not trying to paint any yeah. special picture. I'm trying to get to the facts. That's an accurate picture, isn't it? Well, I, I I think it ignores some important aspects, which is that the 
the payer ultimately. Three pharmacies, 80% of the market? Are, are three PBMs 80% of the market? Is that true? Estimates vary, um, but yes, 70, 80%, three to four. Three dominate, right? Three to four, yeah, depending on They work you... with insurance companies to negotiate prices with manufacturers and then right. tell pharmacists what you're gonna get paid. So rem remember the key part there is that pharmaceutical companies control list price, right? Pharmaceutical companies have uh, a great deal of market power given monopoly privilege. The payer on the other end, the person, the entity, whether that's a labor union, whether that's a large employer, uh, they are able to view options and they're able to say, no, I don't want. The first thing, I mean, I'm not a large employer, of course, but I would want to know what, what is the average spread? You know, you're offering me an alternative. The PBM say, I, I could do spread pricing. You know, here's an option. I could do spread pricing or I could do fees. Well, what is the spread? I mean, why didn't that Medicaid program, I think it was Ohio, that would have been one of the first questions I'd asked if I was an Ohio Medicaid director. What is the average spread price for generics? Um, I hate to find out with an audit down the road. So, so all I'm saying is that there is, uh, uh, there, there are people with skin in the game that are able to push back, and that is the payers. Uh, and, and on, and, Let me ask and, you this. Can a large PBM tell an independent pharmacy, if you work with some new innovative company to bypass our network, we will cut your pharmacy off from our network and subject you to fees and audits? Can that happen? Dr. Mattingly, I will jump around a little. I'm sorry, can you repeat that scenario again? Could a large PBM tell an independent pharmacy, if you work with a new innovative company to bypass our PBM network, we'll, uh, we will cut your pharmacy off from our network and subject your pharmacy to fees and audits? Can they do that? I, I don't know, um, but they, they might be able to, yes. Dr. Frank, what do you think? Can they do that? I think it's certainly a risk that uh, that they can often have the market we think power. It, we think it's happening. How about you, yeah. Dr. Van Nuys? Yeah, I, I think it probably happens. Yeah, and is that is that good? I mean, we got we got the manufacturer, we got the insurance company, we got the wholesale distributors, we got the pharmacists, we got the the uh, PBMs, and that if they can do that, that's probably not good for the one we should care about most, which is the patient, right? Yeah, particularly patients in rural areas or in underserved areas where disproportionately independent pharmacies are the ones who are serving those patients. Dr. Losasso, I started with you. I'll give you the last word here in my last few seconds. Anything you want to add? Well, I, I would, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I would just add that um, pharmacy networks, um, selective contracting, broadly speaking, that, as I pointed out earlier, that is a mechanism that can be used to ensure a high-performing set of pharmacies that can deliver drugs to patients. And I can't speak to any of the sort of punitive measures that you mentioned. I, I don't know anything about that. But as a general matter, being able to create a high-performing network of pharmacies is a useful function because it can improve efficiencies. It can force the pharmacy that can't meet the objectives of the PBM, in this instance, uh, to become more efficient okay. or move on. I was gonna yield my remaining time to the chairman, but as happens sometimes, there's, there's nothing left. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and I'll recognize the gentleman from Georgia for his five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for this very important and bipartisan hearing. And uh, with all due respect to my uh, friend, the country boy from Ohio, I would uh, point out there's a lot of silly city boys who uh, would uh, be interested in the same uh, answers that you were trying to elicit. And I'll point out to the witnesses. Wow, it's great to see we're on the same page for yes, a sir. change, brother. I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. Man, that's an amazing but, uh, day. But now, you know, typically when, when a widget is manufactured, the widget manufacturer would uh, manufacture the widget. The widget would then be placed with a distributor. The distributor would then place the widget with a retailer, and the retailer would make it available to the customer. Correct. 
that's the normal supply chain or uh, distribution channel. Um, but it's much more complicated in the pharmaceutical industry. And I would also uh, point out the fact that, uh, you know, drug prices in the United States of America uh, as relates to pricing for the same drug in a, another industrialized nation, uh, the cost in the U.S., like, say, insulin, for instance, back in 2018, a vial of insulin in the U.S. cost $98.70. And you go right across the border to Canada and get that same vial for $12. And so we see these kinds of uh, uh, price disparities across a broad range, in fact, all pharmaceutical drugs, uh, we see that happening. And we also know that 90% of the pharmaceutical drugs that are delivered to consumers, 90% are generics. So there is no exclusivity uh, issue in terms of uh, patents. Um, so, question I wanna ask, the widget manufacturing process in the U.S. being as complicated as it is, does that same um, supply chain distribution process, is it employed in a place like Canada? Do yes, Dr. Van Noyes. Um, Van Noyes. I, I am not an expert on the Canadian drug distribution market, so I can't say for sure. I do believe that because of a very different healthcare system in Canada versus the U.S., mm -hmm. we don't have the same kind of intermediaries. Well, I, I guess what I want to ask is, do PBMs exist in any other market than the U.S.? Can you answer that, Dr. Mattingly? Absolutely, and I, uh, Congressman, I love your example of the widget. I use that in my class all the time, so thank you for that. Um, absolutely. So in Canada, and, and I had this opportunity right after pharmacy school, I got to go spend about a month with the British Columbia <laughs> Ministry of Health, so working with the province, so it was for the government. So I went and shadowed and worked there for four weeks. Came back, was like, that was like a PBM, right? So their state level or province is making the same decisions. Single, single payer kind of model. Well, in Canada, there's multiple provinces. So it's not as single payer as we like to mm -hmm. think. It's even more complicated there. Well, single concept. Multiple uh, payers, I guess, but right. same sure. concept. Sure. A single payer among various uh, provinces. Well, instead of, instead of our premium payments going to function to a, like a for-profit company that's set up to administer the benefits, it's maybe my tax dollars that are, that are going through that way. So it's just two different ways of handling it. How is it that the U.S. distribution channel for, uh, for pharmaceuticals incorporated the PBM model as, uh, as its distribution process. How did that come about and why? And yeah, is it still useful? It's, it did start in 1958 in Canada and made its way over to the United States in the early 1960s. Uh, we started as prepaid pharmacy card systems. So pharmacists actually helped us create these to begin with because we thought uh, pharmace pharmaceuticals were getting too expensive in the 1960s. And so a way to handle that was let's pay ahead of time and, and, and again, like, knowing that patients are gonna have this spending. So it started, again, to address as the rising cost of drugs were coming along. But uh, again, the rising cost of drugs to your widget, we put these widgets through many years of research and development that have to then meet a barrier that they are safe and efficacious to be, uh, to be distributed to our patients. But that should have no bearing on the distribution process. Oh, no, sir. Okay. I have no further questions, I'll yield back. Thank you, the gentleman yields back. I now recognize the gentleman from Oregon for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank all of you for your testimony. Uh, Dr. Mattingly, what exact part, if, if it's just one part, have PBMs played in the closing of these small pharmacies? Certainly in my district back in Oregon, mm -hmm. uh, it's a huge, huge space. Uh, my, my district's bigger than the state of Washington, and we had at one time uh, small pharmacies all over it. They're disappearing. 
and it's not just pharmacies that have disappeared. We've seen a wave of consolidation. The funeral homes have consolidated, towing companies, uh, doctors have become hospitalists. I mean, the whole thing is collapsing into uh, bigger spaces or perhaps more efficient, perhaps not. So tell me though, what PBMs have done to cause this, this, uh, this, this trend to continue, if anything. Uh, thank you, that's a great question. Um, I absolutely, from my perspective, I feel like there's a, a major just scale difference, you know, and I, I talk about, and again, to try to encourage my students, because pharmacies close and pharmacies do open, so there are pharmacists who seek out to start a new business. If I wanna open Joe's Pharmacy, my ability to negotiate with three companies that control 80% of the prescription drug market is quite limited. So like at the end of the day, it's often that size and scale thing. And it's not just the independents because I think we've seen large chains announce that they're closing stores too, meaning that is our retail market changing? Um, it, it's something that we have to like consider. Uh, even during the pandemic, I, I grew up working at a grocery store. Um, I always loved to go to the grocery. Uh, during the pandemic, I had my groceries delivered a time or two and I was like, that's pretty convenient. Maybe I don't need to go to the big box to get my groceries. I mean, I still do because I enjoy it. But my point is, is I don't know it, how much of it is also a function of the retail market changing that we have to evaluate. It, it, do you have a number of how much PBMs take out of the healthcare system. I mean, it costs the healthcare system. I, I heard one, at one point someone said, it's a very small percentage of the total three and a half, four trillion we spend. Oh, that's a really good question, a really good research question, so thank you for that. Um, I would say one of the things we are focused so much on the pharmacy market side of it, and I think maybe what you're getting at is too, is the pharmacy segment is still a small segment of the overall healthcare spend. Is that, I don't know if that's where you were heading. No, no, my question simply is, PBMs are, are providing some sort of a service, how much of it is it costing? Uh, n no, so I don't, I don't have it. Do you have it, Dr. Richard? Please. Um, their margins are about four to 6%, uh, and Four to six percent, and so if you kind of look at that as, as part of the in terms of the overall uh, drug spend, it's actually you know pretty small because. Yeah, so what I was what the, the articles that I read suggested that we were using PBMs as a whipping boy for a much larger problem, but that's why I'm trying to get at how big a problem is this. If we if we get here, we get busy as yeah. Congress. We're going to solve this problem. How much have we reduced the cost of medicine? Right. So. Uh, that was the point I was trying to make at the end of my uh, test, at the end of my presentation, which was, even though I think it's, there's good things that can happen by addressing the PBM market, but it's only going to do a small, modest amount to really bring down the cost of prescription drugs. Right. That, and I'm sure if, if someone has that number, I'd love to see it. Uh, Dr. Van Nuys, the, um, do you have reason to believe that PBMs are the worst of the middleman, or is there somebody worse? Or maybe they're not bad, maybe they're good, maybe the best of the middlemen, what, 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 where do they fit? I don't think I have a way to rank order them. I will say to your question okay. about you know, sort of how much PBMs are costing the system, keep in mind that the three largest ones are vertically integrated with health plans and pharmacies and so on, and because of that vertical integration, they can shift revenues and, and profits into other sectors. So just because what we're reporting as PBM, the PBM share, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the whole. Right, you've shifted, you've shifted uh, to the entire supply chain and what we're selecting just one part of it. Are you, are you saying that we should change our focus to that entire vertical, vertically integrated thing? I think in the case of a vertically integrated company, yes. Hmm. Yes, Dr. Frank. Yeah, I, I think that one of the important things that maybe we haven't brought out as much is that a lot of these issues are now insurance issues and not PBM issues. Because in fact, as we said, they're all, you know, most of them, 70% of Americans are in vertically integrated plans that have a PBM and insurance policy. And a lot of the things that are going on are driven by the dynamics of the insurance market as much as the PBM per se. Right, thank you all very much, yield back. Gentleman yields back, and I'll recognize the gentlelady from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses. I mean, it's always interesting trying to find the 
particular antitrust angle that we can bring to some of these issues that really kind of cross a, a broad swath of our country. I mean, we know our healthcare system is becoming defined by concentration and a lack of competition, whether we're talking about insurers, providers, drug manufacturers, PBMs, or all the middlemen throughout the system. And we see the impact of decades of mergers and acquisitions, the rise of private equity in our healthcare system, which is causing particular problems and lacks antitrust enforcement. I'm kind of interested in this suggestion we use. What was it Robinson Patman? Was that, no, yes, that, what, that was your suggestion. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but so we see that Americans don't have many choices usually among which insurers to pick or providers to see or PBMs to use or even pharmacies to go to. So that drives the result that Americans pay more for prescription drugs and healthcare generally uh, than nearly other, every other advanced economy. Um, you know, we also see that conglomerates own the pharmacy networks, as, you, as you've suggested. And we, when we look at this whole picture and in, in incredibly the thicket of interrelating um, operations here, we see why the patient often loses out in the fight between the pharmaceutical companies, the insurers, and the PBMs over who has to pay what. Um, I'm encouraged by this bipartisan work um, by our colleagues here and other committees to produce legislation to promote transparency and rein in some of uh, this sector's worst practices. Um, and I would be pleased to see this committee advance serious legislation to combat these problems. I am concerned about the counterproductive attempts we're seeing uh, by the House majority to repeal provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act that have been lowering drug prices for seniors and saving taxpayer dollars. That bill allowed, as you know, Medicare for the first time ever to negotiate directly with uh, drug manufacturers to lower and cap the prices that seniors pay. And my senior constituents are really concerned about the prospect that we might see the significant progress we've made there rolled back somehow. So. Uh, don't want to see that. But I did want to pick up on a couple of the issues that Mr. Benz raised and also some of the issues raised by our witnesses. Uh, Dr. Losasso, what was your suggestion with respect to enforcement? I think it was of Robinson Patman. How would that address the issues we're talking about today? Well, I, I guess I should point out, first of all, that I'm not a, a legal scholar, nor do I claim to be. Uh, but my, my better informed colleagues tell me that um, the, the reason behind the somewhat clumsy rebate mechanism is because of restrictions uh, uh, in Robinson Patman uh, around price discrimination policy. Uh, so so that, that's probably the extent of my understanding of Robinson Patman Act. Okay, so more research for us. Indeed. <laughs> okay. uh, Dr. Mattingly, you noted that the concessions that PBMs get from pharmacies are contributing to <coughs> consolidation of pharmacies, essentially squeezing the independence um, out of the market. What could Congress do to remedy this? And um, when we're evaluating legislation, especially things like NATIC, or sorry, uh, national average drug acquisition cost or cost plus type pricing, because um, I know those kind of things have been thrown out there. Um, when we're talking about what the cost of the drug should be and the cost of the dispensing fee, we need to really understand what is the value of the service that the pharmacist is providing. And when I was a pharmacist, uh, I guess I'm still a pharmacist, but I was a real pharmacist before, um, I wasn't incentivized to tell the patient not to take a drug. Right, like my revenue is based on you filling a prescription. If I say, you know, we talk and we figure out your history and it's like, hey, maybe you shouldn't take this medication, I get zero revenue. And now we swear an oath, so we, like, we do that. But maybe that shouldn't be the case. Like maybe we should figure a way for the care that I provide that I'm compensated for. And, and then there can be a combination of that fee for service and combination of a capitated kind of model. Interesting. Dr. Frank, I was interested in your comments about um, the pharmacy deserts in rural areas, we see a similar thing in the very um, economically distressed urban areas that I represent, but I have limited time, so I was going to ask Dr. Van Nuys. You suggested that the savings that PBMs are negotiating are being absorbed by them rather than being passed along to patients or insurers or other payees, and suggested that one way to better align the PBM's incentives with patients and payers would be to impose fiduciary duties on PBMs. What would that look like? It's a good question. I mean, it's a very complex um, fix to a very complex system. Um, but right now, PBM, the only fiduciary responsibility that PBMs have is to their shareholders. Mm -hmm. And that's not 
necessarily how we want our health care to operate. And so requiring PBMs to act as fiduciaries either to their health plan clients or to the employees and beneficiaries of those health plans changes the focus of what's required of them. Um, that's Okay, thank you. I see my time has expired. I yield back. The gentleman yields back and recognize the gentleman from North Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a, uh, an intimidating kind of witness or, or a hearing in which to ask questions, especially given the way Congress is. You got to run out to do a little speech and get back in. So I miss Dr. Lasasso and I miss Dr. Mattingly. I miss Dr. Frank. I got to hear Dr. Van Nuys' testimony, and then I've heard the questions and the answers. Um, and I, and it, I will say, it all seems like a Rube Goldberg contraption. And so uh, you got a lot of really smart experts, and they do a lot of research. And we never really get to the point where everybody feels like pharmaceutical costs are about right. Never get a lot of satisfaction there. You got some arguments, and then you got. I think Dr. Lasasso, did I get the do I get the basic essence of, of your position that you think the this is really driven by the by pharmaceutical manufacturers and the and the patent system and the fact you got to sort of have a heavy counterweight to them, a bit, somebody who can negotiate with them, and that's what PBMs kind of help that function get carried out? Is that right? Um, in brief, sir, yes, I do believe that PBMs are the, I, I, I think they're not only the tip of the spear when it comes to uh, in, engaging in price competition and enforcing price competition, they probably are the entirety of the spear. Okay. Because of the rest of the way the system's composed, right? Because you got pharmaceutical manufacturing and you got the patents associated with those and, and things like that. And you got all the consolidation healthcare industry through payers, payors and all those kinds of things. They're the, in my view, they're the only entity that really has an incentive to try to pass along savings in, because what they're ultimately selling is insurance, right? So, and the lower the premium, the better. If you can bring down the premium, then you get more business. So do I understand then, and I think even Dr. Van Nuys, again, I heard your testimony. So all of you believe that PBMs play an important role and they're on balance, they're a net plus. Is that correct? Anybody differ from that point of view? I mean, Dr. Van Nuys, what I heard you say specifically in your testimony, if you will, you told us about a lot of things that are problematic, but you also, I thought there was a premise in there that, that, they're, on, that they're really important, and they provide important benefits. Did I, did I get that correct? Yes, they play an important role. You need somebody negotiating drug prices. You need somebody designing formularies. You need somebody managing pharmacy networks. The question, the second half of your question was, on balance, are we seeing those benefits or are we seeing greater costs because of these sort of countervailing forces? The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, said something that probably came out in one of your testimony, that 90% of the drugs are, like, are, are generics. Is that correct? And so that, I'm, I'm sort of left surprised by that. If, if the pharmaceutical manufacturers and, they're, and, they're, uh, and, the, and the monopoly they're provided, and I'm aware of the games they play in terms of trying to preserve patent uh, for longer periods of time and reformulate and so forth, and there's a lot of scam in there maybe. But if it's 90% driven by generics and that's supposed to be, that, that shouldn't be operating, then why? <laughs> Then why do we need? Why does? Why? Why are we having to set up the whole Rube Goldberg contraption for the sake of ten percent of the market, Dr. Lasasa? It, it it's not ninety percent of the dollars. Okay. The, the, okay. So just just to be clear, it, that's it, interesting yeah. and 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 revealing. It's like it's like reading a Bork's antitrust. No, it's like getting uh, having read the Cliff Notes to Bork's antitrust paradox and then coming and trying to ask intelligent questions about it. And so, given the limitations I'm facing on that score, I'm going to yield to the chairman the balance of my time. <laughs> thank, thank the gentleman from North Carolina, uh, Dr. Frank. I, I think you were centering on what might be a solution or an improvement, which was was these independent PBMs. You said. You know, there, there is some hope there. There's consolidation. There's three or four that are controlling everything, but there's some trying to get into the market. What could we do to uh, make them more competitive, or, or is there something we could unshackle to make them more competitive? I think that's a really important question. I, I, I think it's one that I've been thinking about a lot. I don't have a great answer. I do. Give me your best answer. Well, my best, best answer effort. Is that the government now, uh, one way or another, is involved in about half the 
insurance purchases around the country, right? And so there's probably, and I don't know a better way to put it, but there's probably some ways to, uh, as we've done in other areas, like when we started Medicare Part D, is to put our thumb on the scale a little bit to make the market work better. And how exactly to do that, I haven't figured out yet, but I think that given what an important role the government has in procurement of uh, prescription drugs and working through PBMs and PDPs, there may be some ways there to advantage some of these independent uh, entities. The gentleman's time from North Carolina has expired, which means my time has expired, but I, I may come back and ask some of the other witnesses the same question, see if you'd be thinking about it. But I, I now yield to Mr. Ivy, or sorry, recognize Mr. Ivy for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, uh, I want to commend you for this hearing. I, I think this is a, a great example of a bipartisan effort, and I appreciate the panel as well. Very interesting and provocative answers. I do want to, uh, if the clerk could put up the exhibit. Um, this is, can, are you able to see that? Okay, this is from the FTC staff report, Pharmacy Benefit Managers, the Power for Middlemen Inflating Drug Costs and Squeezing Main Street Pharmacies. And I wanted to ask you some questions about this. And, and Dr. Frank, I think you touched on some of this already in talking about how difficult any vertical integration antitrust cases can be. But man, this sure looks like one to me. Uh, you know, you've got the concentration of the PBMs, which is around 80%. I didn't realize until I saw this graphic the extent of the vertical integration. This is, you know, pretty significant. Uh, I want to ask you two questions, though. So even if it's a, a complicated or difficult case to make, um, and it sort of touches on what the chairman asked a moment ago, um, isn't this kind of the, the type of thing that, you know, FTC, DOJ, antitrust should be trying to break up in some way? And if, if we want to try and figure out a way to give the, the other three PBMs, which I guess is, what is that, Humana, MedImpact, and Prime, are those the three? Uh, a chance to, to try and break into that 80% wall. Wouldn't sort of breaking up the relationship between the PBMs, CVS, Express Grips, and Optimum with the rest of their vertical integrated columns, wouldn't that be the way to do it? I, not sure, but and yeah, Dr. Frank, what's your, what's your take on that? Um, you know, it, it certainly is, you know, it's a tempting target. And as I said, um, I'm reluctant just because um, the economics aren't worked out. We don't have super great evidence on that. And it would take us, a, you know, uh, you and I would probably be <laughs> somewhere else by the time that uh, those things got worked out. And I do think that there are other things that we can do in the interim that uh, can be done either administratively or regulatorily that would sort of move the ball ahead. And okay, well, it's for that reason that I... Let me ask you a quick follow-up and then I'm going to yield you uh, some time. So one of the things when I asked uh, unknown unnamed PBMs about this issue, and they said, well, Mr. Ivey, but, you know, the relationships between the PBMs and the other uh, entities in that uh, vertical column are, all those transactions are done at, at arm's length. So it's all done at fair market value. And I said, well, I didn't say I thought it. Um, come on. <laughs> come on. And I think one of you referenced a minute ago about the possibility of sharing um, you know, benefits up and down the stream. But that creates the problem of overpricing at that level and also distorts the information that um, we're trying to get at from the, uh, the transparency piece. Um, and I can't think of another way to address it, but I'm, I, I do want to pass uh, yield, uh, the, re the balance of my time to the gentlelady from North Carolina. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Ivey. And um, I've been working on bipartisan PBM legislation that's been going through energy and commerce. And so, um, and you're probably familiar with a lot of it, but a lot of it given, and I love the setup from my colleague, 
um, a lot of the problem is this vertical integration because the savings are not going to the patients. So yeah, there might be some savings, but they're either going back to the insurance company or they're going to the PBM. And that doesn't accomplish the goal. And that is the antitrust problem. The antitrust problem isn't that there's a PBM trying to find efficiency. The antitrust problem is that the PBM is either self-serving or serving the people that they're contra contracting with and not serving the patient. And that is the fundamental thing here. I love what Dr. Van Nuys said about having some kind of fiduciary responsibility. But I think what we should be thinking about is, if you're gonna get into the business of having vertical integration with PBMs, that the beneficiary cannot be the vertical integration. That is the antitrust problem. And we need to figure out Maybe it's not breaking it up. Maybe it's more regulation for how that vertical integration can work. But that is the nub of it, because the vertical integration is not helping the patient at all. And it is not reducing drug prices to the patient at all. Thank you. And I yield back. Thank you. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. And I'll recognize the gentleman from Virginia for five minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. This is a great hearing, timely topic, and I appreciate the bipartisan nature of it. Um, with the rise in premiums and deductibles and the ever-increasing cost of prescription drugs, it's clear something needs to change. And I'm a firm believer that free market solutions are the best solutions, and to truly have a free market, we need competition. And, and when you have 95% of the prescriptions in the hands of six PBMs, uh, you don't have competition. This hearing is so important because we're seeing clear anti-competitive growth in our healthcare system, the FTC, uh, has uh, said that they are going to be taking action uh, in court, but uh, we, we do uh, want to examine in terms of uh, our Article I powers what, uh, what Congress can do about that. Um, last year, 46 Brooklyn Research released a report on how PBMs define brand, generic, and specialty. They found that those definitions, brand, generic, and specialty, differ from PBM to PBM. In other words, instead of using the FDA drug application designation of NDAs and biologic license applications for defining brand and abbreviated new drug applications and does for defining generic, PBMs essentially make up their own definitions. Um, similarly, the analysis found that a surprisingly large portion of the drugs on the specialty lists were generics, 42 to 54%. Uh, Dr. Mattingly, in your testimony, you mentioned drug price definitions and how that can impact what is paid. Have you done any research or work regarding how PBMs define drugs in their contracts? That, that's a great question. Um, one of the things I kind of joke about with specialty is that it's not really, it's, is it expensive? And, and that seems to be the biggest part of the definition that, that, that leads to that. Um, and I think it causes a lot of problems. So no, I think you're keen to pointing that out that maybe we need to have a more clear definition of what breaks things into these tiers. I saw a couple of other heads nodding. Does anyone else want to weigh in on that? I'll also add that um, I think the 46 Brooklyn folks have also demonstrated that sometimes drugs are reclassified and that from regular to specialty, and then because of the PBM contract, the patient is required to use the specialty pharmacy that is affiliated with the PBM. So that's another, it's not just that the price is different, but now you also have to buy it from my pharmacy. Wow. Dr. Frank? What she said. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Frank, actually you spoke a lot about vertical integration in your testimony. Uh, when it comes to the big three, which side of the business makes the most cash, insurance or PBM? Um, a huge amount of, of the profit comes from the um, specialty and the mail order, uh, a disproportionate part. I, I haven't uh, I'm sort of uh, allocated it all out. I, I can't give you a precise answer, but it's a disproportionate amount coming from the PBM, mm -hmm. those two pieces of the PBM industry. and. Um, what I think is important here is also that because of the regulations on, um, uh, on medical loss ratios in uh, the health insurance side of things, it's very convenient 
or the PBMs to overcharge the insurers in order to avoid regulation because the revenues still go back to the parent company and so do the profits, but they're out of the reach of the regulators. Mm. Does anyone else want to weigh in on that? Well, um, I, th I think that uh, we've got a lot of questions that have, uh, and some legislation moving forward that may or may not address the concerns, but uh, I'm glad this committee is exercising its jurisdiction, and I think there may be some uh, answers that lie in this committee. So with that, I yield back. Thank would you. The, would the gentleman yield his remaining Yes, time? I yield back. So um, may I may I, I take yield it? to the chairman. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Didn't want to take anything that wasn't mine, but I'll take it. Uh, so, you know, what I hear from small mom-and-pop pharmacists is I'm paying $25 for this drug, and, and that CVS or the hospital is paying $5 for it, or I'm filling a prescription, and even before I consider my labor or my employees, I'm filling it for less than I, you know, they're paying me less than it costs me. What level, what scale would they have to operate at to make money in, if they are paying more for the drug than, than they're getting reimbursed? Like, is there any scale that that works, Dr. Van Nuys? Well, no, what you've laid out, there's no scale. It's, you don't make it up on, on volume. Um, but it is true that if you are larger, you can get better pricing from a wholesaler. But that doesn't speak, to, it's not saying that the, the employees are not working as hard at the small pharmacy or that they, they, I mean, there's no scale at which when you're paying more than you're getting for the drug, there's no scale at which that works. So there's something I think wrong there in the pricing. Maybe these small pharmacies are twice as efficient. At, you know, maybe the employees are more motivated. But it's a scale thing, and I think that's a that's a problem. Um, let's see. I recognize the gentlelady from Vermont now for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I represent Vermont, and uh, it is a very rural state, and we are a collection of of small, tight knit communities, and. In many towns and villages, there are small businesses like independent pharmacies um, that are often the bedrock of, of communities. I can tell you, I had the same independent pharmacy for 20 years. It closed recently. And I can tell you, there were times when I went into my independent pharmac pharmacist, and if things had gone haywire with my insurance, Frank would literally say to me, you know, I know you, you've been my, you've been my person for 20 years, Take the medicine, because I have asthma. Take the medicine. We'll get it straightened out. I know where you live. It's going to be OK. They recently closed after decades of, of serving my community. Not the, they're not the only one. And I'm very concerned, and Mr. Benz talked about this in um, Oregon as well, that we do see independent pharmacies closing. And it is a, a very serious concern, not just because of the level of care that you get from these pharmacies, but also in a rural state, you've got to drive then farther to get that, you know, to get that uh, prescription or to get that counsel. And we have an aging population, and you can just imagine, and it's snowy, and it's icy, and it's dirt roads. And so it does materially affect us when these independent pharmacies close. Now, the FTC conducted uh, an in-depth study in PBM practices, and one part of their report really stood out to me. The FTC used a case study of two generic cancer drugs to find that non-big three pharmacies, so those independent pharmacies, like the ones that have closed in Vermont in the last few years, they paid 20 to 40 times the average uh, national price for those drugs. And it goes to what you were saying just now, Mr. Chair. On top of that, the retail chain outlets seem to be doing pretty well, actually. So the FTC found that pharmacies affiliated with the big three PBMs retain nearly $1.6 billion in dispensing revenue above the national average. So I really appreciate all here. I'm glad this is a bipartisan hearing where we're really trying to dig in. Uh, Ms. Van Nuys, I really would like to dig in a little bit on this piece of the independent pharmacies. Why are independent pharmacies at such a disadvantage, in particular when it comes to the generic? drugs? Or are they? What are the disadvantages that independent pharmacies come up against in, in pricing? 
So the report that I was referencing earlier, there is some evidence to suggest that um, the large PBMs who have integrated pharmacies are reclassifying drugs to then require them to be purchased at their mail order pharmacy or at their specialty pharmacy. And there's also, in that same report, um, evidence that they're doing that strategically in the sense that the more profitable uh, prescriptions are more likely to be sent to the integrated pharmacy than they are to independent pharmacies. So I think that's one, one element here. And I think these, these sorts of behaviors, again, back to the FTC report, you know, we would, we would love to know more about how this is happening and what the aggregate results of these, these actions are. And so um, can you explain, you know, just to, to make it as clear to us as possible, we, we've heard a lot about the, the dangers of the vertical integration as it relates to consumers and being able to actually see any value from the PBMs, right? And um, can, can I just see that, that slide? Do we still have that slide available? That was at, okay. So this is bringing me back six years to when I was on the Finance Committee in my state Senate. Okay, it's just as confusing now as it was then. It makes no sense to the average person, to the average consumer, and certainly for those of us who are the, the eyes and ears for average consumers, you can't explain this stuff. We're not seeing the benefit from PBM. Somebody is, but it's not us. So can you also just tell me, how does vertical inter integration really impact negatively independent pharmacies and consumers from your perspective? So again, specifically, these vertically integrated PBMs are taking their, their profitable business and directing it towards their, you know, other parts of their own organization, rather than allowing the independents to benefit from it. Yeah. So basically what we're saying is our, our independents just don't have a shot. They're not, a, they're not on, a, they're not on a, a playing field that they can compete on. They are up against um, a very formidable adversary. I appreciate it. Uh, sorry for going over, I yield back. No problem, thank you for yielding back. And I'll recognize the gentleman from New Jersey for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you for having this hearing. It's, it's valuable, it's worthwhile, and I know it's only the very, very rudimentary beginning, but it's still good, you gotta begin somewhere. Hopefully we can get something done. I'm a dentist. I was practicing dentist for 30 some years and I practiced through even being in the state senate, state assembly, mayor of my town, had a partner and was able to do it. And it was, it's a wonderful profession. Uh, I will tell you, people assume because I'm a dentist that I have the, I know it's, you know where I'm gonna go with this, that I have the answers to healthcare. They go, Jeff, you're in Congress now. And I, of course I sold my practice when I got in Congress. We need you to settle the healthcare program. I, I, a problem, I have people that actually come up to me and say that all the time. And we do have some other dentists and physicians, et cetera. I know of no problem, quite frankly, in general, and I know we're talking a specific subject now, but that is more difficult, more complex, and harder to solve at so many levels. Because every time you do something, there's a ripple effect somewhere else. And it's really a difficult issue. I'm actually candid about it when I'm in a debate or a discussion and people say, well, what are you gonna do about healthcare? And I'll talk about some ideas, don't get me wrong. Uh, and we all know the political talking points, but we also know those aren't gonna be the answers at the end of the day. This is a really difficult issue. So thank you, all of you, for the work that you do. Um, so the first question I'm gonna ask uh, is about the PBMs, the insurance companies, and the manufacturers. And again, you heard it today, and my colleagues asked ex excellent questions. Some folks think it's the manufacturers, some think it's the PBMs, some think it's insurance companies. It's probably all of them. Um, and I guess I'll start by picking on Dr. Mattingly. Um, what would you do? I'm gonna ask this question a couple of times. You're king of the world, man. You're king of the country. And you, your one task in life is to fix this thing. And I call you up, I'm Jeff Van Drew, <laughs> I wanna write some bills, what should I do? You're in control, what should I do? Right. Well first, thank you for the promotion. Uh, <laughs> um, 
one of the challenges that we have is we don't have a process to really value any of these things that you've listed out. Like we don't, we, I say we, like society, like we, we, we struggle to value what is the value we should place on a brand name pharmaceutical? What's the value we should place on a generic pharmaceutical? You mean the financial value? Uh, economic value. No, I mean like what is it if, you know, like an employer, it's important that your employees are healthy so they come to work and are productive, right? So that's why it's, it's you know, in health insurance is valuable to an employer. Uh, for, for patients, so we don't know what the, you know, how do we truly come to an agreement on what a drug price should be. Some drug prices are too low. I keep hearing it's all about drug prices being too high. Some generic prices have gone so low that we run into supply chain shortages. So, like, it's more complex on the other side, too. On the by the way, try to explain that to the public. <laughs> Gee, this drug is too cheap, and it's hurting us. So, you know, that's not easy. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm not the most popular sometimes in trying to explain these things. But the, also, and then you flip to the other side with the, man, with the insurance or the, the PBM. What's the value that they're providing? So I've heard a lot about vertical integration. Well, why, why would we vertically integrate? Like, why would Apple build a $3 trillion company off of vertical integration, you know, with their software and hardware all under one roof? So is there value from a vertically integrated chain or is the, the, maybe the cost of the vertical integration problematic, like where it's anti-competitive? So that's why I struggle because I want to know, like, we can't agree on when the insurance company is doing us a good job and we should pay them, like managing a formulary or uh, setting up a pharmacy network and evaluating pharma the pharmacy network. And then the pharmacist, we don't value, we don't have a good way of valuing the pharmacist services. And again, with you as a dentist, you probably recognize there were things in your practice that you felt like, well, I, I did not get paid well for this, but I got paid well for that. And, and, and so it, 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 sometimes it's mind blowing to think as a provider, what do I need to do? Like, what, what do you want me to do? You know, how, what, how do you value what I do? Okay, so it would be exploratory in nature, and we're not even there, to really determine, to factually try to find out the best route to go. You know, dentistry changed a lot for a lot of reasons, partly because of the debt of the students coming out now. So you all have noticed wherever you live that you're seeing larger facilities that are corporate in nature. In my day, you went out, you put your shingle up, uh, you started out, and you might have some debt from school, but it wasn't so overburdening that you couldn't also have more debt to start your practice. And the same thing, and I want to associate my uh, remarks, associate with the remarks of my friend on the other side of the aisle from Vermont. I'm in New Jersey, admittedly the more rural part of New Jersey, um, you know, down the southern half of the state. But nevertheless, people do, and I, I don't know what the answer to this is at all. Nobody does. We miss the independent pharmacy. There's nothing wrong with the CVSs, the Walgreens, et cetera. But Dr. Lasasso, you said something about their inefficient providers and therefore they go, and I get it. But there's something to providing healthcare that is more than just being a Walmart. And I know we can't define that fiscally, but it's, it's a real issue. And I know, I think they're just gonna go away, to be honest with you. There's nothing I'm gonna say at this hearing that's gonna stop that. Um, how much, I'm gonna ask you all really quickly on this and then I'll, I'll yield back. How much of the cost of all of it and I won't even say all of healthcare, but of pharmaceuticals. Just like in healthcare, we can do surgeries and things we never, ever could do before. Everybody's getting dental implants now. Years ago, man, nobody would ever spend that kind of money or get implants. In pharmaceuticals, how much is due to the new types of drug therapy that we can give people that's very, very expensive? And, um, and would we inhibit that if we put such price controls in that it was no longer effective for companies to say we want to pursue more new and innovative drugs. I'm going to start with you, Dr. Van Nuys. I love somebody that's got a van in their name and just go right down the road and we got to be quick, I know. I, I don't have those numbers, but I do know that what we're overpaying on like the generic side of the market is not going to support that kind of innovation. Do you agree that some generics are too cheap or no? Uh, Sure, I'm sure there are some. Okay. In general, no. But we're overpaying, you believe in? Okay. Medicare is, 21%. Okay. okay. We're, the uh, time has expired. I know. Can they just finish answering or no? We'll let one more answer. Okay. One more of you. We'll go to you. You're next. Um, I think that there's a balancing act here, and uh, the... I think right now we pay too much for brand name uh, prescription drugs, uh, some uh, a lot of times, 
uh, particularly ones where there are multiple other drugs that do more or less the same thing for the same illness. Um, there are certainly some places where uh, paying a high price has been well worth the, um, uh, the freight. I, I think of the um, hepatitis C drugs, for example. You know, high price, good deal. You know, and so uh, the question is, you know, which ones, and that's going back to uh, Dr. Mattingly's point, which is, you know, pay for value. A lot of times we're not getting a lot of value. Thank, thank you for your answer. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Could you ask the question as chair, is this worthy of antitrust action? We may get to that, um, but now I, I need to recognize the gentlelady from uh, Wisconsin for five minutes. Or sorry, Wyoming. Wisconsin? I am so sorry. <laughs> we do, there is somebody on the committee from Wisconsin. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, they're both W. Just don't say I'm from Tennessee, please. <laughs> you know, PBMs may be the best example of the adage that the government is always trying to fix its last solution. Let that sink in for just a minute. Dr. Frank, in your testimony, you said that, quote, retail pharmacies face an array of challenging economic conditions threatening the survival of some of, the op of those operating in rural America. Yet much of what threatens those enterprises not tried to be PBMs, end quote. And then you highlight a number of potential contributing factors in your testimony, but I would like to seek some clarity on your conclusions, as I am from Wyoming and I represent the least populated state in the nation and the ninth largest landwise. So obviously, we have a lot of rural areas in Wyoming that need to be served by pharmacies. And I want to discuss what the top contributing factors are. You even summarize your testimony by saying that, quote, there is little reason to believe that PBMs are the main economic force creating these risks, end quote. But in your opinion, what factors contribute the most to rural America's problems with access to pharmaceuticals? I do think that, um, well, let me start by saying that the independent pharmacy issue is really different between rural areas and urban and metropolitan areas. And I, the point I was trying to make was this is a problem because pharmacy deserts are growing in this country and uh, about half of all place uh, rural areas are served primarily by independent pharmacies. So there's a problem here. I'm just not sure that the blame or the solution is PBMs. And to me, there are other things that can be done in policy uh, that you know, unfortunately, it doesn't relate to antitrust necessarily, but are important fixes for keeping uh, rural places healthy. And I think, you know, we do it in a variety of other parts of our public programs. We do it in Medicare for hospitals. We do it in just a whole variety of areas. And I think that we, there are lessons to be imported into... Such the, as? Such as uh, making payment adjustments uh, for rural pharmacies. So, for example, you, uh, again, you uh, add a, uh, a bump to an independent rural pharmacy when they're like the sole community provider or something like that. And so okay. I think there are policies like that that can pr preserve these things because uh, even though they're at a potentially efficiency disadvantage, they, as a community's resource, they have an efficiency advantage in that they keep people healthy in important ways. Right. I think that we only have a couple of Walgreens in the entire state of Wyoming. We have one Whole Foods in Jackson. You know, we don't have the access to some of these right. chains that, that other places have. Uh, Dr. Van Nuys, turning to you quickly, you provide a number of policy recommendations which include increasing transparency, reevaluating the rebate system, scrutinizing vertical integration, and better aligning PBM incentives with patient and payer interests. There have been efforts in recent years at the state level to make reforms to the PBM structure. Have any of these efforts been successful? Um, I know that the state legislation has been, some of it has been relatively recently passed and is only now being implemented. I have not seen the data that lets us evaluate how that is working. I do know that what they did in Ohio when they audited their PBM and fired them for that 31% spread pricing margin, 
and hired a single PBM to administer their whole, pro their whole Medicaid managed care program. That has been saving them 150 to 200 million dollars a year. So there is one state that has successfully done some reform in this area, and other states have done similar. I think. Okay, um, do you think that this is something that could be accomplished at the state level, or is it your conclusion that Congress needs to act as well? I I do think that some progress can be made at the state level. I do think because these are you know national organizations, it's it may be more efficient to have them subject to a single set of rules. I don't know. So do you have any particular state uh, that you would recommend that we look to what they have done to determine whether that is something that could be implemented on a national basis or that other states ought to be looking to for addressing this issue? So most of the state legislation that I've seen is kind of piecemeal, right? They go after spread pricing or they go after registration or something like that. And so I don't, I don't have, I don't think there is any state that has accomplished the big picture. What about the rest of you? Do you have any examples of where there are states or areas that they have successfully addressed the PBM issue? Well, I, I can speak to at least one situation that I studied that is probably more an example of what not to do, and that was the comparison of uh, Michigan and Illinois, where Michigan uh, thought that uh, it could carve out specialty and specifically carve out those uh, aforementioned um, curative therapies for Hep C, uh, Sovaldi, and so forth, back in 2012. Um, and what happened was that Illinois kept PBM model in place. Um, the market evolved, the market changed. Uh, Sovaldi and other drugs went off patent. Cheaper generics came available. Um, the lack of a PBM in Michigan's context meant that they were not nimble enough to move towards the cheaper generics that became available and cheaper substitutes uh, that were available from other manufacturers, and they wound up spending about $50 million more than they otherwise would have compared to Illinois. Okay, thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady from Wyoming, and I now recognize the gentleman from Texas for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and Chairman, thanks for holding this hearing today, and thank you to the witnesses for taking time to testify. Uh, the one. One of the really thing, great things I like about this hearing is we, we, we're, I feel like we're hearing a very balanced uh, testimony uh, um, on both sides of this issue. It's very complicated. So thank you for a truly an informative gathering opportunity today. For those of us that are still forming our opinions about uh, the PBM issue and what we need to do legislatively, if anything, uh, to fix uh, the rising cost for drugs uh, for Americans today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent to introduce the dissenting statement of Commissioner Melissa Holyoke in the matter of the Pharmacy Benefit Manager's Report, July 9th, 2024. Without the objection. All right. Uh, I want to play devil's advocate for a couple of you here today on some of the things you've, you've talked about. Uh, Dr. Lasasso, uh, if I got that correct, I want to come to you and ask you first. So Dr. Frank, just a second ago, mentioned about pharmacy deserts. And I'm in a very rural area, uh, just like Ms. Hageman is. Uh, I represent Northeast Texas, 17 counties larger than the state of New Jersey, uh, the entire state of New Jersey, um, Mr. Uh, yeah, so I know you can fact check that if you'd like to. But the point is, I've got some counties that don't even have a pharmacy at all in my counties, in my district. So there is pharmacy desert there. As a county judge before I came here, I actually saw the benefit of pharmacy benefit managers. I hired one in our county that came in and said, hey, here's what you can do, do in your self-insured plan to replace the higher cost drugs with more generics. We saved a lot of money for our employees. We kept, kept the benefit to their health high in the process. But then as I visited with my independent pharmacies around the district in particular, I found that they were struggling because of really the vertical integration issue of, of the PBM. So I don't think that this is a widespread, all P, PBMs are bad situation. It's just, there's some unintended consequences here that I think are, are devastating to rural communities in particular. And so I wanna go back to you, Mr. Lasasso, and, and ask, there was a proposed fix over here by Dr. Frank. He said payment adjustments for rural pharmacies. What do you think about that? Well, it's certainly a, a very interesting and potentially beneficial um, solution to the problem that's been brought up. Um, I would never contradict Dr. Frank, um, and, uh, uh, and and so um, I, I, you know, it will probably be gamed it, like all of these types of adjustments uh, and and uh, set asides and and add-ons uh, invariably 
uh, uh, result in. But, but again, if they, like, you, you actually put, you, you, you gave a great example there. You, you were in a situation where you wanted to save some money, you brought into PBM, they were aggressive, they gave you the savings you wanted. So, you know, you got what you wanted. However, then you realized that there were these, uh, uh, what you viewed as, as, you know, spillover effects that, that impacted the, the pharmacist, uh, uh, the local pharmacies. And, and so, you right, know, because, I wonder if you could have it both ways. Yeah, yeah that, and I don't know because I know the pendulum swings and, and, and the, the reason I'm concerned about it is because it, in some circumstances, you mentioned about the inefficiencies of smaller pharmacies and if they can't basically live up to a certain quantity of drugs that they're going to actually uh, dispense and maybe they can't be part of the PBM network. Well, that becomes problematic because now my people in East Texas don't have access to that because there's not a large enough population base in certain areas to have a CVS or a Walgreens. And so now they're not taking their drugs. They're not following up the way they should. And now they have bigger, worse outcomes, health outcomes, that we're all going to have to pay for, and we don't want to have to do that. So there is, there is a real uh, benefit to having the smaller independent pharmacies in all of these markets, and we're seeing them disappear. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of our consumers driven to uh, pharmacies they don't want to necessarily have. So I, I would love to find a solution that works for the consumer, but still stays true to free market principles, because quite frankly, uh, I'm always starting in that, in, that situ in that stance to say, I'm a free market guy, let the market work it out. But we have screwed this market up already. And so there's the other pushback I would have on both sides of the argument is, we are already, as a government, intruding on the free market here. And because we've screwed it up, so how do we fix it a little bit better without further intruding on the free market? Am I off base in the last 30 seconds Am I off base in, in my comments here? Does anybody disagree, Ms. V Dr. Van Eyes? I don't disagree. Okay, Dr. Frank? Yeah, I, I, I don't think we should blame ourselves quite as much. Uh, you know, the whole pharmaceutical supply chain is a creation not of nature, of man, of, of, of <laughs> government. And patents, FDA, um, insure, Medicare, all just all the way down the line, and and to uh, not have any consequences from having built something from the ground up, you know. So I, go easy on yourself. And I've got well, thank you. You're the only one in America that's going to tell me that, by the way. Uh, I've got a lot more questions, and I won't ask them, but I do want to say I think there's space for us to have discussion on the patent reform as well, in particular as it re regards uh, pharmaceuticals, because I think that could be a driving factor to bring down. Uh, costs as well. So thank you all for your testimony today. Very important, very difficult. We need to work together both ends of this spectrum to find a good solution for the consumers in the United States and preserve the free market. Thank you. I, I, I yield back. Thank, thank you, Mr. Moran. Um, and we're up against votes, so if anybody leaves and doesn't hear my questions, I won't be offended. Uh, but I have five minutes remaining. I saved it for the end to try and uh, cover things that haven't been covered. Dr. Lasasso, what's the radical free market solution to this? Just clear out all the underbrush and what would get rid of all the history? What, how do we fix this? You got a, like a minute to solve it oh, all. Oh, that's all. From yeah. scratch. Um, yeah. Um, well, I, uh, boy. Um, geez. I mean, if we're just in, if we're just in the PV, I, I mean, I guess. I told you, I was told you were a free market guy. The, 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 right. The, so, of course, the original sin was uh, 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 allowing for uh, no, no tax on, uh, on, on uh, employer-sponsored health insurance benefits. So, so that, you know, that, that, that weakens the I agree the with you there. That weakens that the, in that, that the, pay the incentives that the payers have to even really think about and push back. Because a lot of what we talked about here today that, that I, I think troubles me is that we are, we tend to be ignoring the role of the payers. The payers are the ones sitting there looking at the proposals from multiple insurance, vertically integrated or not. They still have choice. If I don't like T-Mobile, I'll go to AT&T, right? So I can't really be ripped off that much, right? Even with the 80% that the three vertically integrated uh, in insurance chains. What if, what if Apple owned AT&T? Sorry? What if Apple owned AT&T? That's my concern. That might be a better analogy. Well, yeah, I, I, but then I could still go to back to T-Mobile. You know, okay. I, yeah, but so, with an Android. So okay, I mean, I don't want to monopolize your your, your time here, but but if you want to just you know scorched earth, yeah, get, get okay. rid of the. Uh, we, we, the tax. original sin was was telling 
uh, employers that they should provide this, and then giving them the government benefit to make that, and then not extending that same benefit to individuals who tried to go out and buy health care. So I, I agree with you on that. Um, Dr. Frank, or maybe it was Dr. Mattingly, I don't know, one of you was asked about antitrust action, and it didn't seem like there was a clear-cut case here given the existing law. So I don't want to re-litigate that question. I want to ask a question, is there one piece of law that we could pass, since the existing law doesn't seem to be actionable or clearly actionable in this situation, is there a rule that we could pass that would fix this, the anti-competitive nature of it? Uh, well, I have at least uh, an idea about how you could get rid of some of the, uh, attenuate some of the game playing, the regulatory avoidance. Uh, so uh, what you might do there is sort of handle it the way we handle uh, multinationals, which is insist on transfer pricing. That you have transfer pricing rules that somehow reflect something close to fair market value. Because right now, um, Dr. Van Nuys and I have both made the point that there's a lot of game playing that can be done within that vertical structure to avoid regulations, to avoid What taxes. is transfer pricing? What do you mean by that? So transfer pricing is um, I'm a PBM and I sell services to the insurance company. Well, if my insurance company, is their profits are regulated, then I'm going to charge them a lot because uh, that's off the that's off on the books as a cost, even though it's revenue to the PBM that goes back to the parent company. And so that set, that those second set of revenues are not regulated. They're not subject to like um, uh, mark, margin regulation in health insurance. And so by doing transfer prices, which insists on constraining what can be done in terms of who can charge the other one what, you eliminate or you reduce uh, the ability to play games to avoid regulation and taxes and things like that. Okay, one, one minute remaining. Dr. Van Nuys, you had four suggestions. If you could implement just one of those in legislation, what would it be? Transparency. And, and what would that look like, transparency? How so, would we impose it? So in pricing? So what I want is aggregate benchmarks. Of, of aggregate of average prices at different points in the transaction system. So we already CMS already publishes a series called the National Average Dr uh, Drug Acquisition Cost NADAC, with, that they collect with surveys and they aggregate it and they publish it monthly. And anybody can get it. I can get it. You can get it. Um, and that gives us a benchmark to evaluate one particular transaction. That's the transaction between the, uh, sorry, the pharmacy and the wholesaler, the prices between the pharmacy and the wholesaler. I want something like that at the different transactions in the chain. So I want to know what PBMs are uh, charging health plans to settle a claim, what PBMs are paying pharmacies to settle a claim, what PBMs are negotiating with manufacturers. And I want an average benchmark like NADAC High quality. Net what would you do with that information? Who would I use think it? Market, market participants would use it to understand whether the prices that they are being offered by whoever their counterparty is, the PBM, are fair, are reasonable, right? So any of those market participants would you could use that benchmark. They don't have anything like that now. All right. Thank you very much. My time has expired, and um, that means we are done with the hearing. I. I Appreciate the indulgence of my ranking member here. Did you want to say anything before we close? Just, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you very much for uh, handling this uh, handling this committee hearing in a nonpartisan way. I think the uh, America is much better off with the information we got today. Barely scratched the surface, but uh, got some work to do. And I want to thank our witnesses for your good testimony today. Much appreciate y'all. Well, that concludes today's hearing. We thank our witnesses very much for appearing before the committee. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. Without objection, the hearing is adjourned.